Welcome into the Dog Dispatch. I am John Smith, your host, and we have uh, four windows tonight, Coach. Yes, some, we do. Got some looking forward got some to folks this joining tonight. us. I'm looking forward to it too. I uh, I'm excited to have special guests um, Eddie and Andy. Um, excited for uh, us to maybe cause a little bit of trouble tonight. Who knows? Who knows what we're going to get into uh, in this conversation? Um, but before we do that, if you're new to the show, uh, please give us a like. Please subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast later, following on wherever you're listening to it on podcast is really helpful. Um, and uh, we really appreciate it. All right, Eddie, Andy, thank you so much for joining our special guest tonight. Uh, tell the folks a little bit about what y'all are up to uh, and where they can find you as well. Go ahead, Mr. Eddie. All Patrick. right. Well, <laughs> John and Coach, thank you so much for letting us come on your podcast. We really appreciate it. And, uh, Andy and I kind of got our start uh, with UGASports.com. We do a podcast with Paul Meharry. Um, mm -hmm. Andy and I, I just a quick background, uh, this kind of came about because we would go on the post-game show after Georgia games, and UGA Sports would kind of host something just like this where you could log in and get on the show and talk. And uh, after we had done that for a long time, I would come on after every Georgia game and lament the bad plays, talk about the good <laughs> plays, that kind of thing. Andy would be all positive. I'd be all negative. Anyway, so the host of the show, Paul, came to myself and Andy and said, hey, we want a couple of fans to do a podcast. And so we have started a podcast with Paul Meharry, affiliated with UGASports.com, 730s on Sunday nights. It's called the All Things Georgia Call-In Show. And we decided to enca encapsulate all things Georgia, not just UGA sports, right? So we're doing, as you can see, Hawks. We are doing, you know, uh, Georgia basketball, baseball, the Braves, you know, all sports, Falcons, et cetera. And then Andy and I have decided to do a little podcast kind of leading into the weekend. And we've deemed that A&E podcasting. And that's just kind of a quick hitter on Thursday nights live on YouTube just to kind of set up the weekend as we go into it. So did I miss anything there, Andy? Well, you mentioned that you forgot that John joined us Thursday night, so he was on the A&E podcast, so that was great, and, and we do yeah. appreciate you guys for having us, but yeah, like Eddie yeah. said, we're, um, you know, just a couple of dudes loving Georgia Bulldogs and Atlanta Braves, and well, he likes the Hawks, but I'm like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so. Well, we're going to, listen, we'll talk a little bit about all that tonight, so we're going to talk about G-Day, we're going to talk about the transfer portal, yeah. a little bit of recruiting, We'll t we're going to do a grab bag at the end where we'll talk about everything from hot dog eating to the Braves <laughs> to the Masters, I oh, mean, my gosh. who knows, yeah, who knows where this is going to go, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. If, if you folks uh, look in the description on YouTube, um, you can see where to subscribe to Eddie and Andy's stuff um, and also follow them on Twitter as well. And Coach Hayes, I mean, it is about to be prime time for Coach Hayes. You talk about oh film God. breakdown. He's actually got some film from G-Day. I think he's like a kid in a candy store right now uh, <laughs> over there so drawing. Hard. It's nice I'm to have drawn. football to look at, right? Uh, oh, I guess. Ab yeah, absolutely. So, Coach, tell uh, tell the folks uh, about what you got going on, too. Well, with football season getting ready, I know it seems we get all excited. They get us pinned up and ready to go, and then we have a three-month layover. Yeah. So we get to watch summer workouts, what's happening over the summertime. But what's nice is this transition of all these youngins who are going to be coming in after school's over with all of our freshmen. Mm -hmm that have signed that are coming in as well as, you know, Ben Urasek will be in as well, adding to the tight end room. But for me, it's like absolutely flipping to the cool side of the pillow. I'll pull something from uh, Stuart Scott. But, you know, it's one of those things where I, I'm able to look at film and just break things down and see it from, like I said, a technical standpoint and be able just to connect that fan who's watching the game, got excited about certain plays, and I'm able to, to break that down. I love some yeah. of the matchups we saw. I'm ready to uh, be able to start talking about that, no doubt. Yeah. Well, I can echo that because I watched his videos with a breakdown of the D-line versus the O-line. And mm -hmm. I love watching the – that to me, the O-line and D-line is the fun part to watch. And oh, yeah. I love yeah. the breakdowns. And you were talking about gap schemes and everything. So, yeah, good stuff. Can I can I ask Coach a question here? I've, this has always fascinated me because I don't see the technical angle. I'm a fan, right? I played football. Right high school not at the next level so i see it through a fan's eyes i'm watching the ball i'm not watching all the other stuff when you watch a game coach is it is it fun for you are you just so technically involved in it you're like okay i'm watching this this and this i don't really care about the play the score etc you know what i'm getting at that's that a very good 
Any? Yeah, that's a very good question. What I do is I tend to look – the minute the offense breaks the huddle, most people don't even stay in the huddle anymore. I look at personnel. So I'm going, okay, are they three by one, 11 personnel, 12 personnel? Okay, right. where, where's that? You know, where's the tight end at? Okay, right now they're in trips mm-hmm. nuts or in this, that, and the other. And then I'm watching how the defense sets up to it. So to answer your question, I tend to follow the ball a little bit, and I go back afterwards where I'm able to slow it down and watch okay. it. Okay. But I have a tendency, though, in game, just like a defensive coordinator would do, because that was my heart to begin with, is where I started was on the mm-hmm. defensive side of the ball, is when they line up in their formation, I know exactly where everybody is. I'm going, okay, I see four receivers. There's no tight. I should have one back. Oh, they're empty. Okay, they've got 12 personnel here. So I'm breaking it down just like I'm a D.C. trying to watch what they're doing. So it's kind of a both scenario. Gotcha. Uh, doing both and then like i said once i have a chance to go back and uh take the mm-hmm. uh, film and slow it down and go into coach mode with my little ticker mm-hmm. uh with my mouse i'm able to watch things even more specifically so right. kind of half and half yeah but but you enjoy it though right like i had a friend i'll tell you i have a friend i had a friend who um who uh helped design roller coasters and he could never enjoy riding a roller coaster because he was always thinking about how to make it better. Do you, is that like what you, you do? You, do, you, do you get into that mode coach where it is like, you know, can you enjoy the game with, uh, or are you always like, this is what wasn't working or. I know. tend to be, I tend to be over technical sometimes because what I, I want to see happen is obviously us execute. And when we don't execute the first thing I'm looking at, where's the flaw? Where's mm-hmm. the flaw? Mm-hmm. Where, where is that open gap? What what did we do wrong in this situation? So I do have a tendency to do that, which makes me a little bit on the OCD type A side. But overall, you know, I want to watch the game and enjoy us beat the crap out of whoever we're playing. But there's also that technical side of me, too, that says, you know what, why did that, you know, against, for example, like the Tennessee run, the first play from scrimmage, they run yes, the long gosh. run. The, yeah. You know, the first thing I'm doing, I'm like, give me the replay, give me the replay, give yeah. me the replay, I want to watch it. And the yeah. first thing I saw was a C.J. Allen misfit because of the fire he mm-hmm. gets inside, takes the wrong gap, and that opens up the hole. Yeah. So I'm able to see things that quickly because I've watched it over the years so fast and being able to, because that to me is what makes a great coach is it's not you can have a great scheme and have all your guys ready to play, but to me, the best adjustments that makes a good coach a great coach is when they adjust on the on the cuff and they're able to take and change things during game and actually make things work for them. So we've seen Coach Smart do many a times at halftime and come out and yes. make great halftime adjustments and and do well with that too. Well, I, I will yeah. say I'm OCD as a fan when I watch the game. I get pissed off with they don't score on every play. So that's <laughs> yes, that's that's me. Okay, yeah. and it's understandable. I lo- and that's. That's yeah. what I was going to tell. That's what I was going to tell y'all too, though. That that's that's what's nice about what I'm doing in my craft is I'm able to connect that fan who's watching the game and connect them yeah. to the fundamentals of it, and that that's mm-hmm. what makes it special for me. Like and settle yes, down, Eddie. Good. We weren't supposed to score here. This was designed <laughs> to do this, right? Yes, and and, and, no. and to answer John's question, you know, that's uh, I do enjoy it. I enjoy it tremendously. Yeah. It's definitely a passion. Well, that's great. Well, uh, I'm glad you can enjoy it, and. Uh, you know, I think I think we've all had our moments of um, whether you're technical or not, whether you're coach, you're a coach or not. Um, we've all had our moments of not enjoying Georgia football, oh, yeah. um, and <laughs> we have recently had very very few of those moments. So, um, yeah. I personally, uh, as a fan and and somebody who studies the game, appreciates that from both sides. So, um, speaking of G Day, speaking of you know, you, you mentioned C J Allen. Like we have a lot to talk about. I would love to start this conversation about G Day with two things. Number one, I was there. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Dog Twitter. Um, Bobby Wilson, Greg Fawcett, uh, Pup Walker, Bubby Dean, um, B Dizzle, Dwight, Adam. Man, we had, we had, listen, some people, y'all won't believe this, but some people don't even go to the spring game. Some people don't even don't tailgate for the spring game. Um, I show up and these jokers have a full, I mean, they basically yes. have a liquor store. Wow. Uh, scrimmage. <laughs> um, a full spread of food. Um, we had a great time. Uh, we have a lot of pictures on on Twitter if you want to check that out. But I want to give a shout out to those folks who showed up and supported supported the dogs, not just inside the stadium, but you know, you fans got to train too. You got to test where you are in spring, um, and you know what, what needs to happen between now and the train fall. The tailgate um, up, right? yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So uh, shout out to Rodeo, uh, who's a big part of that. Zach um, as well. Lots, so many. So many folks. I'm, I know I left some folks out, but had a really great time with those folks. Now, what was going on with the inside the stadium was the the important thing. I want to I want to do something to, and and go around the the table real quick. If you had to sum up G Day in one sentence, 
what's your one sentence kind of summary of G Day? Um, and you can take that however you want. Go ahead, gentlemen. <laughs> my, well, my, my summary of G Day, and I'm going to take it about the football team in general is this football team is big and it's fast and it is one of the is one of the biggest and fastest teams I can remember. There we go. Talent all over the place, comma, another parade is coming. There you go. <laughs> Ooh. Perfect. Nice. Definitely. Uh I would have to say I was very satisfied with both sides of the football i'm sorry I, you know i'm definitely anticipating <laughs> great things from them there's no doubt yeah the gentleman below me here said exactly what i feel but as far as just mm -hmm. the technical part as a fan and as like i said coming from a coach's brain i left very satisfied seeing how the defense did versus the offense and you, you felt like there was not really one person you could talk about so just i was very satisfied that's why i'll kind of put it there that's great. Well, I think so. Me, me too. I mean, my my one sentence uh, takeaway is um, better than I expected, <laughs> to be uh, honest. Uh, and that's both about my feelings about some of the stuff I saw on the field. Um, I know, you know, uh, Coach and I talked about this last week where I think for, for Georgia to have a successful G day would be for the defensive line, the defensive front to win about 50% of the reps, mm -hmm. uh, make the offense look a little better bad at times mm -hmm. and for the offense on the flip side to win about 50 percent of the reps right you're you're one team um and so you want to see kind of both sides do good things and sometimes that leads to narratives and storyline the offense not as good as we thought they were in some cases the defense not as good as we thought they were in reality the takeaway is this is a damn good football team and it's a good football team on both sides of the ball um and uh and i think for me you know the defensive line um i said this a couple weeks ago i think people are going to walk away and, and say man the defensive line is better than i expected them to be based on all the things we had heard uh over the spring and that turned out to be the case uh, for me so um coach i'll let you start but you know any any players that stood out uh to you um um, and you know, kind of what are what were some of the the big takeaways, you know, from your standpoint after breaking down the film and and watching watching things? There's so much to to look at, but I'll just focus on one from each side of the ball. Janelle Aguero, if he's going to be our nickel, he's going to have a great time in practices all year covering Dominic Lovett in the slot. Yeah. I think he did a great job <laughs> of competing with him as the number two receiver. Very, I mean, Carson Beck throwing dimes through the mailbox, mm -hmm. and uh, you know what I'm thinking to myself: Why would you not think that if I need to get better in passing coverage, why not be covering Dominic mm -hmm. Lovett every freaking time I'm out there? That's going to make me a better player. So I definitely was uh, lacking the fact I was wondering about his pass coverage concepts, what he was going to be able to do. And he proved to me that he can definitely cover a number two receiver because he won some, he lost some. And that's what I loved about the mm -hmm. competition between the two. On the offensive side of the ball, you know, you could sit here and name uh, a bunch of different players. But, you know, obviously I'll steal the thunder here and dominate love. It obviously is that slot yeah. player that we really want to see. I mean, yeah. just some of the yeah. some great catches. Dominant but, you know, love it. Right. Yeah, dominant. Love, dominant. Exactly. love it. I love but, that. But you know, I can I can go with him just because he stands out right immediately, uh, just because of his route run. And I told you uh in earlier pods that he would be someone that we would stand out this year because this is year two under his belt. He's got more of the playbook under, he's more comfortable with Carson Beck. And I think that's the reason why you're seeing more productivity for him. I think it's just the beginning of many great throws and catches we're gonna see from them this year. That's my two takes. Yeah. What Andy, Eddie, what, what what were some of the you know players that stood out? Anything that, that stood out to you uh from the from the game as well? Well, I'll take some of that low-hanging fruit as well and yeah. say CJ Allen. He yeah. he is going he may win the buckets award this year. He's that good. He mm. he's big, he's fast. No, that's not an exaggeration at all. He <laughs> sideline yeah. to sideline. You know, I know he's got two threes on his jersey, but he looks like one that used to have just one three. He looks like Roquan. He he looks elite. Yep. And um, and on the offensive side, well, I'll go just kind of special teams more. Anthony Evans, I think he's a mm -hmm. legit weapon, and I think mm -hmm. he is going to be really good in returning punts. So yeah, I'm I'm excited to see him the whole year. Yeah. So I watch G Day because I want to see the young kids and see what we got mm -hmm. coming up, right? I mean, we know what CJ Allen can do. We know Michael Williams is going to dominate. We know Dominic Lovett is going to do those kinds of things. So these are the three that stood out to me, and I'm not going to even try to say his name. JJA. How do you say his name? JJ. Mm -hmm. uh, you know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Made yep. a lot of plays, okay? A mm -hmm. lot of plays on defense. 
and I'm, I'm, I'm going to couple this with two other guys, and you'll understand what I'm getting at. Sokovi White mm -hmm. made a great catch in the flat, and as he's running mm -hmm. down for a touchdown, another kid blows up the cornerback. And you know who that was? Nitro Tuggle. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Now, what do all three of those players have in common? They are all, I think, 17, maybe 18. Mm -hmm. They should mm -hmm. all be in high school right now. Right. Okay? And they're out there making impact. This kid, JJA, doesn't turn 18 mm -hmm. until next November. Think yeah. about that. For, he's I know. a grown yeah. man already. Okay? <laughs> yeah. And I love what Sokovi White and, and Nitro Tuggle brought to the table. That, to me, was the most encouraging thing, to see those young kids out there competing who should be at prom, but they chose to come to Georgia and be better with Kirby Smart. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and listen, I will say um, uh, one of them, KJ Bolden, I think ended up at prom uh, this week. Oh, did <laughs> yeah, he really? did. after the yeah. yeah after yeah 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 he posted his he prom photos prom. Um, mm -hmm. yeah after uh, after after G Day so um, and I didn't but, even yeah, mention I, him right I mean you can mention yeah. KJ Bolden right but no, I, I, those are the three that kind of stood out to me Bolden was one of those John that's kind of a given mm -hmm. you know that this kid's going to be a star we kind of know that yeah. right. Um, that's why I named those three because we were kind of like, ah, how are these players going to be? And they shined to me. I loved it. No, I, I agree. I think what you saw is that, you, you know, what Kirby Smart has never hid the fact that he uh, that he recruits for size and speed, you know, yeah. criteria. That athleticism, like you saw that all over the field, you're always going to see that. What I saw from those young guys that I thought was, was hugely helpful for me uh, is um, – the instincts, right? So obviously they got a long way to go to learn all of these schemes sure. and the complexity yeah. of these calls and whatever. But man, these kids like were th their instincts of how they actually responded and reacted after just one, you know, uh, a few weeks of spring practice. Um, separate from you know all the stuff that they're getting put in their head of you know all the co the coverages and the motions and the you know um, uh, the the option routes and like all these things that you got to learn and you know on the defensive line like all the stunts and everything like all that stuff. Separate from all of that, they're just their instincts. Uh, you got a team full of football players, and I know that sounds it's like you know, no, no, duh, John, but um, no, that's not always no. the case. A lot no. of these young guys, like they don't, they don't show, they show up super athletic, they show up, they don't look lost. Athleticism. <laughs> yeah, but they, but a lot of times they, they look lost, and their instincts sometimes are not dialed in to no. what Georgia is trying to do. This, this game, even the mistakes that were made, it was like it was directionally correct, it just like didn't quite get there. And, and when, that's what and I one, loved about one more thing with yeah. that, John. It wasn't yeah. like the way Kirby ran this thing, they weren't yeah. going against the fourth string scrubs, <laughs> it was the <laughs> ones and the twos that were on the field for the majority yeah. of the football game. So, yeah, I mean, these correct. are legit athletes and guys that know the system that they're going up against. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and putting putting these young these young guys, you know, that's why that's why you play a spring game. And we we'll talk about we're going to in the grab bag, we'll talk about some other approaches to a spring Clown game. Shows, yeah. But, but well, yeah, but what I love what I love about, you know, uh what Kirby did, right? Versus like the the 7 on 7 that Ole Miss did or the 2 on touch Ohio State did. I mean, he he put guys out there and played football and forced them into pressure situations in Sanford Stadium with 55,000 people there. Most of them, this is the, the most people they've ever played in front of in their entire yeah. life um, they've ever mm -hmm. seen in a, in a stadium. And you're in Sanford Stadium and you're wearing, you know, it's they have these closed scrimmages, right? So they've played in there before. But, like, this is – you're you're on ESPN. Like, you're on TV. You're playing – you know, it's all of these things. I think that, that combination of all of that, I was really impressed with the young guys. The one thing I will point out, and Coach, uh, we, we went back and forth on Twitter on this a little bit. He has a good break breakdown the the main thing that i loved personally was um watching that front seven the the way that they played on defense with just the the technique that they played and especially you mentioned cj allen yeah. in the sec championship game the biggest issue that georgia had the and the reason i say you know people blame bobo and whatever I say the biggest the biggest challenge in that game was you had two freshman linebackers and Kirby Smart mentioned it on the sideline in an interview between the he third did. and fourth quarter where you had two freshman linebackers that were just fighting for their lives out there um in a in a game against a very experienced offensive line a very mm -hmm. savvy yeah. experienced quarterback and the greatest you know coach of all time on the other side 
and those guys, um, their their gap fits just weren't quite there when they were running stunts, when they were trying to play the run, when they were you know doing a lot of things. And so um, that's what allowed Alabama to kind of gash them um, in some places, especially in the second half when they went down and you know and took the lead. And you didn't see that on Saturday, like you saw. When they ran stunts, the stunts were tight. The, they were hitting the gap. C.J. Allen um, was just – if you go back and, you know, if, if, if you want to do an exercise and you want to uh, test your football knowledge, go back and just watch a little bit of that Alabama game. Watch some of their bigger plays, especially when Jalen Miro like, takes off. Watch where C.J. Allen goes. And then watch G Day and watch where he goes, mm -hmm. and it's just a it's a big difference. And so that for me um, uh, was was a really big uh, was a really big breath of fresh air too. So just so much good to take away. Um, the other thing, uh, I, I you know, on the flip side, right? So there's a, there, we we've talked about it a little bit, but uh, should you know should Georgia fans be concerned about and kind of anything coming out of G day. So whether that's offensive or defense, you know, some people said the offense had, you know, maybe an off day in some places. And then what, what did we not see? Maybe this is the same kind of question, but what did we not see that you wish we would have um, at, at G day? Um, I'll let, I'll let y'all take that one. Whoever wants to go first. Well, I stole thunder last time. So I'll let the gentleman y'all go for it. <laughs> go ahead, Andy. Okay, well, you know, a lot of people did say, and I even said the offense had a little up and down to it, but um, you had Carson Beck. He threw the ball 48 times. When's the last time he threw the ball 48 times <laughs> in the game? And when is the next time he'll do it? It's not happening. Never. Never. This this game is set up to throw a lot. The defense that they're playing knows – I mean, they know the calls. They see it. So, no, I'm not concerned. You got guys – I know Beck made a couple of questionable throws, but you, you know there, there's nothing to worry about. This this team looks as good of a team as we've seen in the spring for the Georgia Bulldogs and for anyone in the last several years. Yep. Go ahead, Eddie. So your first question is: Should Georgia fans be concerned about the offense having an off day? I would relate mm -hmm. that more to the defense having a there great day. And yep. there is nothing that drives me more crazy as a fan watching a game tip balls and it was tip ball yeah. after tip ball after tip ball and that tells me the defense has learned you can't get to the quarterback get your hands up and make a damn play there right on the line of scrimmage and they did that mm -hmm. numerous times so i've heard kirby both. yelling that in practice Eddie. yes I those heard are you hands up hands up hands up and i love no nah, defensively i love that offensively i hated it right but mm -hmm. yep what did we not see that we wish we would have seen? For me, mm. it was the long touchdown home runs mm. to Arian Smith. Where is that? Yeah. And Carson Beck still just just a hair of a concern oh, on those long, deep balls. He's not quite accurate yet, but it doesn't mm. matter. Look at that throw he made to Ra Ra Thomas on the sideline. What, 1% of quarterbacks in the NCAA can make that throw? That was ridiculous, yeah. okay? Yeah. It's all new wide receivers as well. That's right. He's still he, – and that's the other thing I was going to say. If we're concerned about the offense, what did they have, three weeks to prepare for this? This is not <laughs> fall preparation, yeah. first game. Offenses are all kind of lagging behind defenses, right? It takes yeah. a game or two to get going. So I have zero concerns about that offense other than that deep ball home run. That's what I want to see mm -hmm. more of. Yeah. And you saw it a little bit too on the defensive front. It's funny. I watched, uh, I watched a little bit of like Chaz Chambliss, for example, there was so many times when that dude was just in a straight up like pass rush mm -hmm. set as an edge. Like he knew they weren't going to run the ball. He was right. like, I'm just right. about to, about to blow this guy up. And I, right. yeah, well, and I think Kirby, I think Kirby does a lot of that intentionally, right? People don't realize yes. like a yes. lot of, a lot of times, mm -hmm. like the defense either knows what, it's going to be run mm -hmm. or they know that it's going to be a pass and, and they're setting up these like pressure scenarios in scrimmages. And so um, for me, I think that's the number one reason why Georgia fans shouldn't have any concern about it. Besides right. the fact that, you know, a lot of it just isn't realistic in terms of, you mentioned it, right. the, the amount they're going to throw the ball, all those things, pass. but man, yeah, but that, but that dime that, um, that Beck uh, dropped to Dominic Lovett as well um, early in the game where he, he threw it um, over, you know, just threw it right, just dropped it right in a bucket over um, mm -hmm. two mm -hmm. in between two defenders. I mean, he made some throws that are some absolute, like pe you just don't know how hard it is to make those NFL throws. throws. NFL throws, yeah, yeah. NFL, NFL throws. throws. 
going full speed um, against really athletic athletic guys, and uh, and so and Dylan I, I Bell had a touchdown. Him. Dylan Bell had yeah, a touchdown. Yeah, he did. He oh, did. That's what I was about to add. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Coach. Yeah. What? 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 What would you? What did we not see that you wish we would have? Well, you know, honestly, it's really tough when you're playing more vanilla defense because, from a technical standpoint, I'll answer the two questions uh, based off this. You're running two man, so you got two safeties mm-hmm. over the top in zone. Everybody else is manned up. It's really hard to press the vertical factor in a mm-hmm. game. And it, honestly, where you have to press it at is at the number two receiver position where you got safety on slot instead of it being corner mm-hmm. on, on outside Z or X. So that's the reason why we saw a lot to Dominic on, on those kind of plays where Janelle was right in his hip pocket. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, Carson Beck, I don't know what it is about that front left pil- pylon where Ra Ra caught that uh, Kentucky touchdown where barely had his foot in. Same thing with Dylan Bell. That was a touchdown. That's the difference of us saying, you know, Carson Beck has three touchdown mm-hmm. throws and, and just one interception on a freak play by Mikhail where he gets the ball deflected up and just yeah. Mikhail makes an unbelievable yeah. play there. Um, yeah. But what I, uh, but you know, that's, that doesn't bother me from an offensive standpoint. You know, we bookended it very well because we started really with a touchdown, ended up with a field mm-hmm. goal. Obviously they didn't let us have the touchdown. And then at the end <laughs> made the throw to rah, rah, and then the unbelievable catch by Dominic against the fence. Yeah. there, catching that ball almost pro throw wise back in yes, the day. I remember um, around the back. But, uh, you know, what did we not see that we wish we could have? I wish we could have seen some reps from Ryan Puglisi. If we were yeah, getting all the younger kids that were out there, yeah. I honestly, you know, we got to see Gunner in a little bit more of a, you know, in-depth look and what he could do in the mm-hmm. pocket and his footwork and, you know, going through progressions. But it would have been really nice to be able to see Ryan Puglisi make some throws out there and see what he could have done as well. Well, I'll piggyback yeah. on that. I would have loved to have seen Malachi Starks and Smart London out there with the number one defense. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen just yeah. a few reps of that. <laughs> I know Ray the ID, was, the ID right. was out too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. is it funny that we almost kind of forget, and I hate to say it, Smile Monday, you better bring your game, brother, because Raylan, <laughs> Raylan Wilson is making people even forget that you wasn't even out there for spring. You know, I know there's some people that do, but, I mean, I know that realistically they're doing a great job, those two youngins. Yeah. 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 Love it. Um, speaking of, so we're going to, uh, we'll, we'll talk uh, just real briefly on recruiting and then, and then I want to talk about the transfer portal a little bit, but recruiting um, we, Georgia, depending on when you're watching this, if you're watching it live, uh, then we're talking about it now, but if you're listening to it later, this may have already happened. Um, there is a uh, Georgia's on commit watch for, mm-hmm. um, for tomorrow for a 2025 quarterback in Ryan Montgomery, um, out of Finley, Ohio, uh, a guy who his junior year was a finalist for um, Mr. Football in the state of Ohio. Um, it just, a, you know, threw for almost 3,400 yards and, and 38 touchdowns. Um, big, tall, pocket passer kind of guy, but rushed for 257 yards and 10 touchdowns in his junior year. Uh, so very athletic guy, too. Um, coach, two things. Number one, um, all, all signs are pointing to Ryan Montgomery committing to Georgia. Um, so we can talk about kind of what that means, but do you have any, you know, kind of thoughts on, on Ryan Montgomery, what Georgia fans should be excited about, um, you know, with, with this uh, QB that's potentially committing to the dogs, you know, doing all of his, uh, I do know that when, you know, the Zollers kid decided to go ahead and commit to Missouri, Ryan Montgomery upped his commitment date and put it on the calendar, which made me really think that Georgia was his fit. And now he's crystal ball. And I think towards us, but, I think what he brings is a peace of mind. I think he is a solid quarterback who sits and almost profiles very similar to Carson Beck. He has good feet. He has good pocket uh, presence awareness. He moves very well in the pocket. He throws a very good ball, even on rollouts. You know, it's very, it's very good to see quarterbacks nowadays show film footage of not just the vertical, uh, but Mm -hmm. also throwing from like right hash to opposite out, you know, to across the field and uh, showing the accuracy that comes with that. I think he really solidifies and gives Georgia fans a peace of mind of having a quarterback signed in the 2025 class. And it really takes away from all the drama that's going on with Julian Lewis, which I'm really not sure if they're continuing to even pursue him. I know Kirby mentions in his pressers all the time, we're never going to stop with these guys, no matter who they commit to, because there's a lot of time left between now and uh, obviously December. But I really do think Ryan Montgomery gives a peace of mind to the coaching staff as well as to the to the fans of of of, uh, of Georgia to uh, to have him in that 2025 class. That's my take to it. So you, you, you that was my question, Coach. You think mm-hmm. if if he commits tomorrow, right? Juju's mm-hmm. done. They're not they're not going to pursue him anymore. That's over. I, 
I think one of those things that comes back is that Kirby's going to say that we're going to continue to pursue. Right. Julian I know what Lewis. he's going to say. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Gonna yeah. Do, what he's going to say versus what he's going to do. I think they do. They they don't pursue Julian. Either. Okay. So let's say he doesn't commit tomorrow. Okay. What happens? Then, there? What happens there? Uh, that's a good one. Uh, I think they're still <laughs> going to pursue. I think they're still pursuing anybody that, you know, like I said, from Julian's standpoint, does that ramp is, it up for Juju? That's my question. Yes, it does. I think yeah. it does ramp it up for us to try to go after him, no doubt. Um, yeah. You know, I think a lot of people are satisfied with the fact of what Ryan Puglisi could do. I, I'm not really going to be sold on Gunner yet. I like Gunner as a player, but I'm not really sure if he's going to be that number two. I, I've told John many times that I think Puglisi will overtake Gunner as really? the next quarterback. I, I think that I wow. do just based off what I've seen on film. It's a matter of how quickly he picks it up though. And, and that's really the thing. It's not just the arm talent being able to come in there and throw every throw that they need you to throw, but just based off what I've seen, I just find that Pug seems just to have that a little bit more of an it factor and nothing hmm. against Gunner. Honestly, I think Gunner could go in and satisfy what we need, but I don't think he's going to be that prolific quarterback that, you know, we've you know seen from other people in the past. But hmm. I, I honestly know that if, if Ryan Montgomery does commit somewhere else, because South Carolina has been basically mm -hmm. his yeah. really on his hip for the time being, is that if he decides to go to, you know, South Carolina and doesn't choose Georgia, then we're going to, we're going to try to get Julian with all that we can. I think a lot of things are going to start working in that direction and gravitate. But gotcha. I think, I think Ryan gives us a peace of mind if he does commit to us tomorrow. Okay. Well, I had read yeah. um, that the, mm -hmm. the if Montgomery does commit to Georgia, that it has no effect on Juju Lewis at all. Like it, that Georgia will still pursue him. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Listen, listen. I think I think there's a number of different there's a number of different things to take away. Number one, um, uh, our our friend Eric at the Bulldog Report um, said in the chat, I've heard Juju has canceled his official visit after the Montgomery buzz. Um, mm -hmm. That's not true. Um, he's he he hasn't canceled anything, um, at least from what I understand. Um, and I honestly don't think he will. Like I think I think Georgia. Um, I mean, I think there's two things at play. Number one, you don't know what's going to happen. December is a long way away. Yeah. So the players don't know what's going to happen and Georgia doesn't know what's going to happen. This is a new world that we live yeah. in where you cannot, I mean, as a player or as a school, you can't shut things down. No. Unfortunately. And I know a lot of fans, you know, a lot of fans don't like that because, you know, players say um, I'm a thousand per, uh, that commit to Georgia. I'm a thousand percent committed. My recruitment shut down, but I'm going to go take these visits. And yeah. people are like, yeah. well, if you're committed and your recruitment shut down, why are you taking these visits? Right. Because the coach can process you out for someone else as a player yeah. or um, the school, you know, or, or things can change at Georgia mm -hmm. in your situation. So mm -hmm. whether, you know, I don't know who knows your, your, your position coach leaves, like there's all kinds of things that can happen. Um, so I think these players, uh, honestly, I think they're doing themselves a favor to continue these visits, uh, as well as the school doing the right thing of continuing to pursue them. Now there is a difference between the way that you pursue a player, right? So there, there is a difference between uh, Juju Lewis feeling like he is Georgia's absolute number one priority, like Arch Manning is a good mm -hmm. example of that, where Kirby like yeah. went all in. He's like, I'm not taking another quarterback. I'm going after Arch Manning. There's a difference between that and between and Georgia taking a quarterback and then continuing to call and text and you know it's kind of being being a little bit more transparent, and open. It's like, hey, we got to fill this room and we want you here. Uh, but you're not going to be the only guy that we're going to take. And I think that is what it changes with Juju Lewis um, in particular, if Georgia takes, you know, Ryan Montgomery. Um, but I also think, you know, it's funny because we're talking about Juju Lewis. I think Kirby's not going to stop calling uh, Matt Zollers either. Like, I think, I like, saying, I think, Matt, yeah, that's I think, point. I think that guy, that kid that's committed to Missouri is a, is a kid that he's going to keep calling for sure. Um, and so, yeah, of course, you know, Juju is, is getting all the, all the buzz, but, um, but I think I think Georgia was very very close on Zollers, and I could see them actually you know pursuing him a little more uh, heavily than than Lewis, um, even whether Montgomery commits to Georgia or not. A lot of people think um, he's better than Juju Lewis, so that's what he's coach I'm about Zollers. Coach right? Hayes, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Co coach Hayes is one of those I think oh, uh, yeah. that yeah, likes him more. Doubt. That likes him more. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. Nothing against that kid. I just think that he has yeah. a more prolific profile as a quarterback in what we're wanting in our system versus what Juju mm -hmm. can bring mm -hmm. to our program. And that's yeah. just a player personnel uh, file versus, you know, just his overall athletic ability. I mean, based off his athletic ability, he could execute 
But I just think with what we have and what we want, I just think mm-hmm. Zollers and the Montgomery kid probably would be better fits for us. That's just I how think I he was. I think he was number one on Georgia's board. That's just what I think from reading the tea leaves. Yeah. Not, yeah. not to crap on this segment, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. As a fan. <laughs> Dude, please. Um, these are 16, 17-year-old kids who are making verbal commitments that mean absolutely nothing. Yep. And so yep. it's just hard for me to get excited or disappointed yeah. at this point about any of these kids, you know, until they sign cool. that line and say, letter of intent, I'm committed. It I doesn't mean anymore. anymore. Right. It's just because it's not it's a silly season and it's, and it's become that way in college football. Right. With the transfers, et cetera. So it's no different there. Sorry, John. Go ahead. Yep. No, you're good. No, what what I was going to say is, is this and it's, and it's oftentimes not the kid making the verbal commit. It's, no, exactly. it's the kid plus their inner circle. Plus, Absolutely. like there's a number of voices. So who knows? AJ Bolton. We saw that last I, I'm gonna year. Remind, AJ Bolton. Exactly. Exactly. I'm going to remind. I was just about to remind Georgia fans of that. Last August, KJ Bolden said. Over and over, I'm a thousand percent committed to Florida State. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he said yeah, that sure. multiple mm-hmm. times. He there was an interview where um, uh, one of the recruiting ser- services was doing an interview with him, and he was like, Yeah, he's like, I, yeah, I like Kirby Smart, I appreciate it, but I don't really want to talk about Georgia right now. I want to focus on Florida State. I'm a, like, he was saying stuff like that in August. So Again, it works both ways, right? So mm-hmm. I think if you if you're wanting uh, this guy committed to Georgia uh, to be a hundred percent committed, shut down his recruitment, not take any of these other visits. Well, it, you know, if that's what you want, um, then do you want that for these other guys that Georgia's continuing to call? So in my opinion, you know, I think you got to do you you got to just go through the process. And to Eddie's point, December's a long way away. Speaking of um, our, uh, our our buddy JT put in the chat, the portal doesn't know what's going to happen either. <laughs> No, it doesn't. <laughs> the portal. I think the portal. Yeah, the portal is is uh, has no idea what's about to hit it. Um, speaking of the transfer portal, so Georgia, the, the transfer portal hasn't been as crazy as expected for Georgia yet, as of uh, April the sixteenth here on a Tuesday night. Um, we have a few players uh, in the portal for Georgia: uh, wide receiver uh, Tyler Williams and running back Andrew Paul are two of the the you know the top names that have entered this week. Yeah. You had Chad Lindbergh who entered in March, and then uh, Braxton Hicks, a walk-on wide receiver as well. But um, Tyler Williams, Andrew Paul, um, Georgia has to lose. I mean, we, we just get ready because Georgia has to lose um, at least at least two to four more. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and I also think that you know I think when this is all said and done, I, my personal opinion is I think Georgia is going to have about eight guys that end up hitting the portal over the next 14 days. Um, so counting these two that, that hit this week. So I think we're probably going to see about six more guys. And mm-hmm. um, with all that being said, just in general, um, what should Georgia fans make of the transfer portal? And, and just like, I, I would love just have like an unfiltered, you know, <laughs> conversation on this spring transfer portal window. Like, should it even exist um, what is, you know, what, what is this doing in terms of college football and rosters, you know, like just would love y'all's thoughts on, on any of that as well. Go ahead. Uh, I, I do. If, if they're going to have the transfer portal, if this is a thing, I do like the spring, mm-hmm. the spring window simply because yep. it gives the players a time to see, okay, I know I'm fourth on the depth chart. Look at Andrew Paul. He's probably good enough to go start for 90% of the teams across the country. Maybe that may be a high number, but you get my point. He knows that he wasn't going to start here, and he probably wasn't going to get a lot of playing time. So he can go to another school. Luckily, it's not going to be in the SEC because he can't transfer to the SEC during this spring portal. But I do like it. I think if you're going to have a portal, if it's a thing, you need a spring portal. And it helps the coaches because now they know, okay, I need to go out and get a backup running back. I need to get a backup wide receiver. So, yeah, I do like the spring portal. If we're going to have the portal, let's keep a spring portal. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to jump ahead here, John. Keep yeah, the please. spring portal as it is, right? Yeah. Is it a week? Is it two weeks? I don't even know two the weeks. length. I think it's two, two weeks. weeks. Two weeks. Two okay. weeks. Yeah. That's fine. That's it. Do away with that crap back in December when you're preparing for a bowl game and your guys are transferring out. You don't know what the hell's going on with your roster. That is ridiculous to have that. Mm-hmm set of circumstances going around with everything else that's going around your football team. Completely do away with that, okay, and have one two-week window. I like it here, like Andy, right here in the Mm -hmm. spring, after the spring game, that gives kids a chance to figure out what's going on. The coaches have an idea of their roster, right, at that Mm -hmm. point. 
It's ridiculous that other that other in the, in December. That that is insulting yeah. to the sport. Yes, yep. there's a lot of ambiguity that comes from the portal anyway, just because, like I said, you have those two different windows that happen. But I would I would say if you had the lesser of two evils, definitely have the one in the spring. I agree with you yes. on that. Yep. Um, just due to the fact of what even you know Andy was mentioning a while ago, I think that just helps with your roster management a little bit it differently. Does. I'm mm -hmm. really surprised though to see what litigious issues are going to come from this though, because I really do see eventually some people challenging the fact of you can't you know transfer from our perspective oh, to another fine. SEC school. I think yeah. you're eventually going to see us probably you know there's going to be some players out there that challenge that rule as well since we're seeing a lot of That's, that across the. Uh, you know, well, if you if you NCAA. say I would say just a caveat on that. I would say you can transfer wherever you want, right? That two week window, you do away with mm -hmm. that SEC rule, right? Yes. It's an open window for two weeks, yes. right? And you're they right. only had the one portal window. Yes, I correct. Agree. You can go, yep. wherever, correct. You you go yep. wherever the hell you want. It doesn't That's matter, right. SEC, whatever. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So, but you're right, coach. I mean, the it's the litigiousness of all this. You know, I'm a, everybody's suing to do these kinds of things, and it's become it's just yeah. out of control. And the mm -hmm. problem is, they just let it all. They just they just went like this. Everything was in lockdown, yeah. and then it just went boom, yep. and it's just yep. all out of control. The cat's out of the bag, and there's no getting it back in. It's no. just completely yeah. out of control. Yeah, well, and what's going to happen? What's going to happen is yeah. What's going to happen is that um, you're going to end up to to your point to all of y'all's point. The one the one thing I change I would get rid of I would get rid of the December window. It doesn't make any sense to have free agency in the middle of a season. Um, and number two, I would change so that like you, you sign a, you sign for a year and you are committed to that team from that, you know, so let's say the end of the end of the April 30th, the end of that transfer portal window, if you're on the roster at that point, you're committed to that team through until April the 30th of the, of the following year until that next trend, that spring transfer portal window. And then from that time, you know, I would even make it, you know, 30 days and let them go. You know, yeah. April the first, the whole month of April, you can transfer wherever you want. Um, you can do any of that. I think the one, the one challenge, and the reason the SEC has tried to keep it, you know, where I think the reason the administrators have agreed is because it is, you know, you go through, you go through that uh, spring um, session with a team, you go through off season, et cetera, and then if you go to the school, you know, down the road across the street that you play the first, you know, two weeks of the game, and now all of a sudden you got your, you know, playbook and everything else. Exactly. I think that's part yeah. of their reason. But to, but to me, I, coaches can do that. I mean, a coach yeah. can, you know, no which is even which is even worse, right? Like a, a position right. coach can actually get a buyout uh, from can be a running back coach at Georgia, and this is this is a hypothetical, but I'm sure there are like real examples I could use in the SEC this year. I'll, I'll actually use one: the um, uh, Mizzou, the defensive coordinator, Mizzou, um, uh, left to go to Texas A&M to be yeah. um, uh, to be on uh, or LSU. I'm sorry to go be the, the yeah. defensive coordinator at LSU, coordinator. and and he took yeah, and he took like two position coaches with him, and that's a guy who is like you know. <laughs> Leaving an SEC school, going to be a coach at another SEC school, so there's no reason why players shouldn't be able to do that. Um, so that's the that's the one thing uh, that I would change if if you're gonna you know get rid of that that window and just make it just make it open, but make it where you have to sign some commitment. And I think the other thing, I I think the litigious piece of it, you got to be real careful because players have pushed and pushed and pushed and wanted this to be a business. And now they're going to get treated like a business. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that is not, you know, it's, there is there, it's not all sunshine and rainbows when, yeah. um, you know, when they're not, they're not sure even, what they've even, asked for. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Even, I mean, even revenue sharing, right? So you look mm -hmm. at that revenue, you're like, okay, revenue sharing. Well, that, look at all this money. Okay, great. How much percentage are you going to get? Yep. Like, what are you, and it's going to be yeah. capped, right? Is it, is yeah. it revenue sharing plus NIL? Do you get all these, you know, marketing opportunities on top of it? Or is it now you're an employee and, and kind of your confine, like what are the parameters? So I think you have to be really careful um, when you're going to court and being litigious around this yeah. stuff, because um, you can really end up as we've seen, um, you know, uh, I'll, it's, it's, 
I'm, I'm bitter because it's, it's the day after tax day. Right. But as you've seen, it's like, yeah, you <laughs> know, it's like, okay, cool. Yeah. Well, let's, you know, but it's like, oh yeah, well, let's take, we need roads and infrastructure and we need blah, blah. Okay. Yeah. That's all great. And then I look and I'm like, what the hell is going on? You know? And so I think you, I think there are things that on the surface, it all looks like, okay, yeah, this all makes sense, yeah. but it's all about who, you know, what are the rules and parameters? Who's controlling those rules and parameters? How does that end up affecting me as an individual? And I think that's some of the stuff that's getting lost in all this transfer portal madness. Um, and I think that's something that players, you know, again, they, they don't know. You mentioned it, Eddie, like these are um, the, the people asking for this are are either people in inner circles that likely have no experience with it themselves. Mm -hmm. They just see a lot of money and they want some of that mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. Or it's players who have gone through it and it felt like they should have gotten more um, mm -hmm. because maybe, you know, maybe they ended up, you know, not making as much as they are not going pro or whatever and thinking that they should have earned. And I think I think players should get paid. I think you got to figure it out. But I also think you have to be really careful with the way that you. Hey, you before we them. move on the the, the transfer yep. portal, one more thing. Can I kick it around here and ask each of you guys please, your prediction? Please where, go for it. Where Andrew Paul we'll ends up. I'm already Georgia yeah. State. I'll let you. You said Georgia State, okay, Andy. I said that about yeah. three months ago. <laughs> yeah, I, really? I'm a, I'm a agree with that. Yeah, I think it's going to go with Georgia State. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, of sense. I'm gonna, gonna yeah, I'm, I'm taking a swing. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna say Oregon. Oh, oh you took mine. mine. That was mine. Think, I took well, yours. Okay. Yeah, that was yeah. mine, Lanning. All right, I'll go different. Yeah. I'll go Syracuse. Syracuse, yeah, yeah, that's there a good go. fit. Syracuse I, I, I'm doing with too. you, John. I think that's. I, I, I heard that today. I was like, that's it, Lanning at yeah. Oregon. Yeah, Oregon. Yeah. Oregon also needs a, they need another running right. back for like a one two punch kind of situation. Um, they also have uh, nil dollars. Um, yeah. You know, that's what I was going to say. Not to knock actually, Georgia State, yeah. but I'll knock Georgia State. Oregon ain't Georgia State. Right, right. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, I think it's. I, but I do think. I, I mean, I think Andrew Paul to Coach's point though, that he made on our show last week. I think it is, it's dependent on if you're making a move for a relationship and development yeah. and like you, you know, like, you know, that, that I'm an NFL caliber running back and I just need to continue this, you know, with Del McGee um, in my relationship. Or if it is like, can I get both? Can I get yeah. NIL? Can I get playing time? Can I get development? I think Oregon is a place that can offer you that. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of smoke too around, um, around Purdue because Purdue has taken quite a few Georgia players and Purdue has a pretty decent like NIL machine. Um, I, I'll say this. Andrew Paul may very well, by the time you're listening to this on a podcast later, he may have very well committed to Purdue. Um, I think that would be, I think that'd be a massive mistake. I think for him, yeah. I would, I think, I think you, it, it, I, my personal opinion, John Smith, um, my, his opinion, um, knowing very little about his, his situation. Um, I think you, I think I'd go to Georgia state and get developed by Del McGee and the staff that knows you that it has worked with you for the, the last couple of years. Cause even some of those, um, offensive analysts and, and, co you know, those second, third layer coaches have followed Del McGee over to Georgia state. I'd, I'd do that before I go, you know, up there. So in your mind, Purdue is a money NIL thing. Well, That's Purdue is spending money on Georgia players right now. Right. And I'm, but That's I'm saying. Thing. He goes to mm -hmm. Purdue. That's probably a money thing, right? Is that what I think, saying? yeah, and I, and, yeah, and I think, I think it's a money thing, and I think you'll, but I think you'll get. It's probably a playing time thing too, obviously, okay. but yeah. I think you'll get the least development going that going that route. Yeah. Oh, I agree, one hundred percent, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yep. Um, all right, good, good talk. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna wrap, we're gonna dive into the grab bag here for a few minutes. All right, I just have like this. This is a free for all. We got all kinds of things. You, if you're watching uh, this live, if you have questions, uh, anything you want us to talk about, throw it in the chat. We'll just we'll just open it up and have some fun here. Um, we're going to start with Georgia baseball. So Georgia baseball is ranked in the top 25 again this season. They're ranked number 24 uh, in D1 D1 baseball rankings. Um, the SEC is just a, the SEC has the top four teams. Uh, right now, one through four in college baseball, um, and then they and then they and what's wild is that the number one team is Texas A and M because um, you know you would think like SEC has the top four teams you would think like oh well it's it's got to be LSU or it's you know Tennessee, Arkansas or, yeah, nope. yeah yeah Tennessee no nope, it's Texas A and M um, that's not what we want to talk about Charlie Condon has twenty four home runs right the SEC record is forty home runs by LSU's Brandon Larson in nineteen ninety seven he did that in sixty nine games the ncaa record is 48 
uh, by uh, I don't even know his last name. This guy named Pete. Pete Incavilia, man. I remember in my Cavillia. top's baseball I cards. Can't, with I just can't say. Yeah. Texas in 1985. Stranger. Now, Pete, Pete Incavilia got 75 games that season to hit 48 home runs. Charlie Condon has 17 regular season games left, plus whatever Georgia does in the postseason. Does Charlie break either the SEC record of 40 home runs in a season or Pete Incavilia's uh, NCAA record uh, at 48? Do y'all see him getting to either one of those? I don't think so. He's averaging about – he's averaging a home run every one and a half game currently. I just mm -hmm. don't think he's got enough games to get there. I think he'll hit somewhere in the 36 range is what I think he'll get. I was kind of yeah. pulling the same factor of 35. I was thinking yeah. that's about where he'd be at mid-30s. Yeah, one and a half yeah. a game, that just kind of adds up to be in that range. So. Yeah, I, I'm kind of in that wheelhouse too. I mean, the first one, yes, he has a chance at that 40. Uh, 48, mm -hmm. absolutely no chance. But he's got a shot yeah. at that 40. I think. Uh, he can sniff the 40. He can yeah, sniff I that think thing. he could do that. And I, I kind of did a calculation like you do, you did, Andy, one and a half or so a game with 17 yeah. left. Yeah, you know, he, he might could get there. He's got a chance at that one. But, I mean, yeah. who cares? This guy is incredible. He's yeah, an he unbelievable that's, baseball player. That That's that's what I was going to say. For me, um, I, I don't know if he'll get there or not. I You know, I think my my personal lean is that he won't. I don't know what Georgia – I don't know what Georgia ends up doing in the postseason, especially with uh, you getting the, the three and four deep uh, in our pitchers and who knows, all bets that's are right. off. But right. – um, so I don't, I don't think he has enough games, but to your point, Eddie, I mean, for us to even be sitting here and even thinking about this could be a possibility for a Georgia baseball player, number one. Number two, it's not just the home runs. It's his OPS. It's his everything. batting average. Batting it's average, like, it's yeah. hits. It's everything. Uh, one of the – the in my opinion, you know, the, the best – Not uh, to mention a kid favorite. who just loves Breeze UGA. That's what I love. Correct. And it's Correct. just a great yeah, – right? Right. Yeah, a kid that that took a walk on because of the yes. stupid way yeah. that baseball scholarships mm -hmm. work <laughs> took a ended up taking a walk on um, because he wanted to play at Georgia, which is uh, and for him to be able to do this, um, I just think is incredible. So um, Georgia, you know, they've got Ole Miss this weekend. Then you turn around, and you get number one. We'll see where they are when when they come when we play them. But then you get number one Texas A and M. So we're about to see about to see what we're made of here, guys. Um, uh. Another one on the list, Kirby Smart and the Georgia coaches. So uh, they were coaching these guys hard at G-Day. There's there's a couple of uh, guys that I know who are down on the field um, who said that some, that some of the things that they that they were being yelled at some of these guys were like they were they were like, dude, this is is some of the hardest coaching that they have ever seen in a spring scrimmage. Um, uh, I hear I it every was, single day on the practice field. He does yeah. not stop. Yeah, Andy talking. hears it. He's out there. He can hear it where he works. He does yeah. not He does not stop. It he is, does I mean, not he, let up. He cusses the players, the coaches, everyone. Yeah. Andy texts me yeah. and says, I'm uncomfortable right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll i tell you. I Well, I'll tell you all off air. Sorry, y'all listen. I'll, I'll tell you a story <laughs> about when I went to Georgia practice and some of the stuff that Kirby said. But – um. What's there's a there was a uh, a clip that Brent Rollins uh, shout out Brent posted that I that I retweeted today of Kirby like doing the finger like calling yeah, somebody that, over that, there. Can I what, stop you, here, Tom? Did we please, figure yeah. out who he was doing that to? Has that been determined? No idea. I no, I will go figure it out. I'll go figure it out because I'm curious, but I yeah. I don't. I just want to I just want to believe that he was calling some young DB over there to just like give him an ass. <laughs> you. That's what I want to believe. Uh, for I all I know, his son, his son for making some. Yeah. Yeah. It, it could yeah, be. Yeah. Andy did it. There you go. <laughs> it could yeah. be. Um, but yeah. So what, what is the worst like ass you and you've ever taken sports or, or otherwise, what did you do to earn it? And, uh, and who gave it to you? Oh, I remember when oh. I was playing middle school ball. Yeah. I got, our coaches, they cussed us. Like, I remember, well, actually, my coach that coached me in middle school football was my coach that he coached me in Pee Wee football. He was mm -hmm. cussing us when we were in fourth or fifth grade. And I remember, like, oh, God, he's cussing. And my dad said, yeah, that's right. Shut up and go practice. You know, I mean, it was, he, he would cuss us nonstop. And some parents would get upset. My parents didn't care. You know, they were like, yeah, listen mm -hmm. to him. But I remember him just yelling at us and cussing us when we were in fifth and sixth grade. And it was, I was like, man, this is, this is nuts. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. My senior year of high school at Trine High School, mm -hmm. I was uh, 
actually, excuse me, it was my sophomore year, and I was on the scout O team, and we were running a play where I had to run a crossing route every time. And for some odd reason, we just decided to, they got us on a loaf, then they got us on an incomplete pass, then we got to the, and all of a sudden we've got these defensive All-Americans that know what the play is now. So now they're playing all the routes, and Coach Gable continues to say over and over again, 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 <laughs> we ran that play 18 yep. times before we finally, you know, room finally was able to get it to our curl route because he threw it to me three or four times. And of course I'm so dead. To, I felt like that was the having an outside of body experience. I mm -hmm. felt like I was going to die. It was and at that time, coach, they didn't give you water, right? They like withheld. No, water. no. no. What's no. Water? I, yeah. I saw you yellow. Earn I saw the yellow water. Yeah. I, I saw yellow That's spots. right. I had yellow spots in front of my eyes. I seriously <laughs> thought I was going to die. I had to run that crossing yeah. route 18 times before mm. we finally completed it. And I can still remember to this day, Coach Gable going, oh, again, oh, again. <laughs> you know, so that was pretty tough on me remembering that as a sophomore out there doing that. Well, mine was, I went to Marist High School. And I, I, have y'all, mm -hmm. do y'all know who Brett Bear is on Fox News? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I went yep. to high school with Brett Bear. He's a good, very good friend of mine. And this was after football season. We were actually in a play together, Brett Bear and I. And uh, this it was filler on the roof. He was a star. You know, mm -hmm. Brett's obviously a star. But um, I don't know why this stuck out to me. It was not a coach. It was my parents. And I had to go. I was late, running late for the play practice or whatever. And we had this back door with a head of a glass pane window, probably the size of the square around me. Right. And I was pissed off at my parents. And I slammed that door behind me. And guess what happened? That some bitch shattered. shattered everywhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And, and I just remember my dad laying into me. And that's the worst ass chewing. I, now, it was well-deserved. I was angry, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. I paid yeah. for it, got it cleaned up. But I, I'll never forget that. And, the, and when you said that, John, that's what came to me. It was not a coach. It was not any, a teacher. Yep. It was my parents or my dad. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's incredible. Um, I, I I have many of them. This will shock y'all between coaches and parents. <laughs> Uh, probably the worst one I ever got was probably from my dad, but uh, I won't I won't share that because he's a he's he's a man of the cloth. He's a pastor up in Northwest Georgia, so we'll we'll keep him uh, clean of this. For well, me, I, I'll pastors go with one. Can't get angry. I mean, come on, <laughs> have emotions, right? Right. No, I, mean, I don't want. I don't want. Right deacons, I don't. I don't want the deacons calling him over a story I told on the podcast. <laughs> but um, the wor the worst one for me uh, was was from a football coach, uh, Tommy Welch, who. Um, was my high school coach along with uh, with George Bobo, Mike Mike's dad. I got plenty of them from both of them, but uh, Coach Welch, uh, who he coached um, at at West Rome, you know, in the early '80s when West Rome won, you know, four state championships in a row. Just a real, and then he coached at Thomasville in South Georgia. Just a real ball coach, and he uh, was one that made you earn the water in the '90s. Um, you you know, it's it's you'd be passing out over there, and he'd be like, "Oh, you're you know." You're fine. Just yeah. stand, up, stand up, you know, put your hands on your helmet and breathe. Um, yeah. just that kind of stuff when you're really like, you know, having a heat stroke. Um, yeah. but, coach, but coach Welch, uh, he, he told me one time, he said, uh, I'll never forget. I, I kept missing. I played outside linebacker and I kept running. We ran an exchange stunt where defensive line would go out. I would come in, you know, kind of fill this gap and I could never get this stunt right to your point coach. Um, and uh, man, he laid into me one day about that. And I'll, I and I don't I remember a lot of what he said, but the main thing I remember him yelling was, "You're as useless as tits on a boar." Mm. And he just starts yelling like, you know, like you're as useless as tits on a boar. And I'll never forget like that just ringing in that practice field in the baseball field outfield of our Archie High School in Rome, Georgia. Oh, uh, so that was that was it for me. It was good times. Yeah, well, uh, my coach he told us he said you're good, but you're not that good. There's somebody that'll take yeah. your spot. So, <laughs> like, oh, hey, that was you, always. I was going to yeah. say, as a coach, you have to do that. That's a spirit of humility. I I wouldn't care if you were the best player on the team. I fire your ass at least once every other yeah. day just to make sure yeah. you realize that you're not someone yeah. that can come out here and be a prima donna. No doubt. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that the, those were the days. Uh, all right, couple more, a uh, couple more uh, things to talk about. This one, I I really want y'all's thoughts on this. Okay, <laughs> this is the important thing from the weekend. Ole Miss had this carnival, basically. I'm gonna put this spring of Palooza. Okay, so Ole Miss. First of all, they paint their field in like this 50 yard seven on seven like scenario, 
Then they have a dunk contest. They have a uh, a tug of war that included uh, sorority girls uh, doing uh, participating in the tug of war. They had Joey Chestnut out there eating hot dogs. Um, Joey Chestnut ate 20 hot dogs in 90 seconds. What do you make of this like spring carnival situation? Is it good? Is it bad? Are you indifferent to it? Is there like what what are your what are your thoughts around it? Um around uh whatever Lane was doing out there in Oxford. I'll go. I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go I'll for go. it. Yeah. I'm glad our coach is not a freaking clown. Mm. Period. You got one in South Carolina, you got one at Ole Miss. They're clowns, okay? Would Kirby Smart ever in a million years do what you just described, John? Mm -hmm. Ever? Mm -hmm. No. No. I, so I'm indifferent. Do whatever you want. Have fun. Eat five million hot dogs, Lane. Have a good time. <laughs> We're going to kick your ass in September. Yeah. That's yeah. the way I am. You, you finished ninth in the country. You have – you're going to be ranked preseason five, seven, eight in that range – like mm -hmm. act like you've been there. It's it's exactly. a clown show. It is just like, like you said, Kirby would never do it, and it is a clown show. You, I know Lane likes to have all the attention toward him, and I know come to the yeah. sip and all that, but it's yeah. it's a clown show. And I thought it was a joke, and the Joey Chestnut hot dog eating. Come on, give me a break. That's that's, that's, <laughs> that's very well said. Did he throw frisbees at dogs too. I mean, did he do that too? He should have done that, I, right? Had the girl, I, I, the little Chinese girl that does the bowls at Hawks game. <laughs> just do that too. <laughs> Bring it all in, right? That's awesome. Yeah, I agree. I agree with JT in the uh, chat. You know, it was kind of like if you ever saw Caddyshack too, where they're trying to play mm -hmm. golf and it's like a cartoon carnival. I remember that, but mm -hmm. you know, I like the way Andy put it. Is that act like you've been there before? Honestly. If you're trying to appeal to these guys to be their friends, there's a difference in earning the respect of them mm -hmm. as their there friends is. versus mm -hmm. coaching their butts yep. and yeah, making 100%. them good stewards of men and making them understand, yeah, there's time in games to have fun because Kirby has done that. You've seen it. Sure. Yes. You know, video sure. clips of them having a great time. You know, they did that big slip and slide thing. They went and raced oh, yeah. uh, the bowling kid out at the track. Fit. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of different things they've done to have fun. But the, it's been yeah. in a way where it's uh, where you still have the respect for your coaches. It almost like a, you know, you kind of go into the clown show mentality with what they it did. Is. And honestly, you can, yeah, it's the kids were happy. I'm sure they were excited. I'm sure they oh, were yeah. like, oh man. But I, there's just a respect factor that was lost for me and Kiffin yeah. doing that. So that's the way I feel on it. Yep. Yeah, and I, I think for me, I think I feel I feel very similarly. I think you know, like if you want personally, I think, dude, if you want to play four quarters and in between the quarters have sororities out there doing tug of war, like I don't have any problem. Like you know, if you want to make it, I do think like if 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 you want to make it a fun day and you want to do these things that are a little bit different, you know, in between quarters and you want to make it feel a little bit more, you know, I don't know, light. Um, like minor league baseball no, type things. Yeah, like have no yeah. Pro have no problem with that. Um, my biggest issue, I think there's two, there's two things for me. Number one, um, and, and JT uh, said it in the chat, it, it was a chance for meaningful reps for younger kids. Yeah. You have, you have kids, you know, in who can, who can actually get some type of game scenario who were, you know, mid years last year or who were new to Ole Miss who can get out there on the field and actually show some stuff. So I think that's a missed opportunity. Um, and number two, I mean, I think the biggest, the biggest thing is just like, you at the end of the day um you're setting the standard for your program and i i'm just an old school kind of guy because i've seen the guys who have won these national championships <laughs> yep. and 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 even goofy you know uh water boy cajun guy ed ogeron like the guy had standards like in terms mm -hmm. of the actual program right like he respected the tradition of the program he respected the tradition of the stadium he respected mm -hmm. the tradition of like of of sec football and i think for me the issue that i had was the respect of like mm -hmm. dude all these people that came before you that built this program um and you're coming out here and and doing a hot dog eating contest in the middle of the stadium like you know what i mean it's like i because i think for me it's just it, as again i'm a <clears throat> traditionalist in a lot of ways um mm -hmm. but i think like old miss is much bigger than Lane Kiffin. And oh, maybe yeah. Lane Kiffin knows, he knows that he'll never be Georgia. He knows he'll never be Alabama. So maybe he's right. taking, you know, this like different route in terms I of like think that's what it is. Yes. 
It is. Yeah. He knows, he knows like, like he's not, he's not at that level. And so he knows like, you know, maybe he thinks like the reps aren't as meaningful because he knows that he's going to get his ass beat. Um, in, he's a in gimmick the coach. Anyway. He's yeah. a gimmick but, coach. Yeah. But for me, it's the respect factor. And I just think like you, you are a head coach in the SEC where there are literally thousands of coaches that would kill to have right. the job that you mm-hmm. have and, and to go out good. there and yeah. And to go out there and treat it like it's the, the freaking Coosa Valley fair yeah. um, is just, you know, to me, I think is just a lack of respect. And that's always like for Lane, you know, w- whatever people can say what they want to say about his, his tweets or whatever. The overarching thing for me with Lane Kiffin has been, the lack of respect that is felt that he has had the way that he left Tennessee, what happened to USC. Like people can say like, Oh yeah, he's, he's humble and he's changed. And, but you see this kind of thing happening over and over with him where it is like, he's always pushing these weird boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's the biggest issue that I had with it. Um, And, and also why I hope, and even Ohio state, it's like doing the two end touch thing. I don't have an issue. I don't have an issue with two end touch. Like if you're playing football, like you know, if you don't, if you don't want your guys to tackle, like I, I think it's stupid. Um, but personally, you know, it's fine if that's what you want. But to go out there and to, you know, again, it's like you're, you're at least you're playing war. football and not even. Yeah, dogs, exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. To paint, to paint the field, the uh, freaking end zone at the fifty yard line. Yeah. You know, to me, it was just so much of like, dude, there's a lot of people that came before you and this university will be around a lot longer than you. And I think um, Lane Kiffin is trying to make himself bigger than uh, yes. than the the job that he actually has. And so, again, but you said it. You said it well, Eddie. Like, I'm I'm thankful that Kirby Smart is our coach. I'm thankful that, uh, you know, um, that you have a guy who respects tradition, but who also just like knows what it takes he's like you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna miss this opportunity to get out here and coach these guys well, let me ask you this. In front of, did georgia get yeah. better on saturday did that did our football team get better saturday 100 percent. did, did old miss's football team get better at eating hot dogs yeah probably so. there you go that's it that's the only thing they got <laughs> yeah. better at was yeah. hot dogs. It, yeah and speaking of i mean 20 hot dogs in 90 seconds coach how many hot dogs can you put down in 90 seconds <laughs> You, 90 seconds uh i could say three or four if i could try but uh, not 20 there's no doubt about that and i like a good hot dog yeah uh, everything yeah. on it but you know you know going back just two interjections first off think yeah. about the parents of these kids that got to watch their children play on the football field on saturday mm-hmm. at, in sanford stadium mm-hmm. did those kids at old miss get that opportunity seeing your child be able to go out there and execute and have a good time and be able to be a part of something that's bigger than them. That's so special for not only the student athlete, but for the parents who get to come in and see that, that didn't get witnessed at Ole Miss. And you know, the thing that I look at from, I'm going to add to Ohio state. I'm going to interject. I don't understand why we can't hit to, I mean, even if you're going to two hand touch, that's still teaching terrible tactics. of it is. I agree. I why, like can't, it why can't we hit to a thud to the V of the neck, put your helmet in the V of the neck or try to and hit to a thud, wrap them up and stop their momentum and then just don't go to the ground. I know Coach Coach Smart does that a lot. Why can't Ohio State does that? That teaches so bad technique, mm-hmm. so many bad techniques to your defense, and just saying, okay, just run up and you can touch him, and that means he's down. Uh, I, I agree. even kind of clown Ohio State, too, for what they Me do. Me, too. I, I agree. Because what's Ohio State's problem been the last few years? Their defense has not been mm-hmm. very good. Mm-hmm. And you're going to go out there and touch me. I, I think it's as big of a yeah. joke as the Ole Miss crap. Yeah. Yep. And JT and JT says, you know, what if a bigger job opens up if you're the AD at Florida, for example, after watching that, do you even give Lane a call now? I, you know, I, here's what I will say. Yes. I think he does. Yes. Well, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, because I, because I think here's what, here's why I think that, I think that teams are so desperate and what Lane mm-hmm. has done is Lane, Lane has won nothing. Let's be very clear. Lane Kiffin has won nothing of substance at Ole Miss period but he has managed to win more than he's lost the last couple of years and i think there are schools right now that are craving like i florida you tell me like they how much they would give to have a They're five and seven the past seven. three years john yeah yes. yeah yeah so so i think that's why he still keeps giving uh still keeps getting jobs yeah. what i will say though is i do think that you uh i do think that there's many many jobs that Lane Kiffin, I mean, just think about it. If Lane Kiffin had managed, like he's built this roster that seems to be a decent roster. If he had managed to win 10 games, uh, you know, in 
last year. And then if he had turned around and won 10 games again with the schedule he has this year and make the college football playoff, mm -hmm. think yes. about some of the jobs that it yeah. could have opened up for him that I believe personally that the lid – was put on some of those jobs because of some of the stuff that he's been doing like this uh, mm -hmm. spring of mm -hmm. So, sure. um, uh, and I also think, uh, you know, I also just think I would love for him to go to Florida. Cause I would love for, I mean, we saw what happened when Ole Miss came to Athens. I mean, Kirby just beat his Stomp ass. That and, team to death. Uh, yeah. That'll be, a, think, that'll uh, be another nemesis for us, right? Like Dan Mullen, right? Cause right now yep. I don't hate Florida the way I did before with Napier. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I hate because he don't matter. He's not good. Yeah. Right. He's not. Yeah. He's not yeah. Mullen wearing a freaking Darth Vader mask <laughs> to a conference. Right. Yeah. I mean, I hated yeah. that guy. So yeah. yeah, that would be nice. Let's get him to Florida, yeah. and I can hate him again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. A uh, couple more, just real quick topics, and we're gonna get out of here. Uh, Andy, I just wanted your thoughts. Y'all, y'all talk about the Braves on your show. We don't talk much uh, pro sports here on the Dog Dispatch, but. Uh, since you're here, I wanted to give the people a little bit of flavor of what what you do. Tell me, tell me about this Ozzy Albie's injury. What, what are the Braves going to do um, now? You know, you got Spencer Strider uh, that's out. You got Ozzy Albie's on a ten day DL. Um, what's <laughs> what's AD. going on over there? Yeah, well, so Grant, Andy, Grant do you have, said you have Mark, six. Andy, do you have Mark Bowman's latest tweet? Do you four have to that? Six weeks, right? Is okay. it four to six weeks? No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, no, I, I hadn't read that Grant McCauley said it was four to six weeks. On no, that. Mark Bowman has, has recently said Snit did not give a timetable, but it sounds like there's a chance he could be back in two weeks, which means three mm -hmm. weeks might be the safer bet. So that's there we go. much okay. better than what we thought. Uh, that, yeah, All because right. I didn't, yeah, All right. No, that's good that's to know. Because good McCauley to know. Had said, he had said four to six weeks earlier today. So, right. Yeah, that's big. No, and, and that's if it's only three weeks, I don't think you have – that big of an issue yeah. because you got yeah. you got guys that can play defense and I think and I saw RC yeah. has already went deep tonight and I, I mean Ozzy is hitting 317 he's got two home runs you know he's having a great year but you know for three weeks that's not that big of a deal the bigger deal is Spencer Strider you lost your ace you lost the guy that most people thought was going to win the Cy Young Award you lost the guy that may be getting 300 strikeouts we were already discussing who the fifth starter was now it's who's the fifth starter who's the ace. And we saw Darius Vines go four and two thirds last night. He looked good. He's not Spencer Strider. Yeah. I just, I just gave Spencer Strider a couple of weeks to get back to JT. Yeah, well, so yeah. let's just, let's just say it, see if it happens. Now. <laughs> a couple of weeks yeah. times 26. How about that? How about yeah. 52 weeks and he'll yeah. be back. Now, I, that one. Yeah. I don't know what you do there. There's nothing you can do. Yeah. You can't replace that. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll see Ozzy back uh, real soon. Um, uh, because man, we need him. Need his bat. It just changes the whole lineup, the whole dynamic of, of this team. And you know, the defense. Like that. He's fantastic. Yeah, the defense, defense for sure. Yeah, for yeah. sure. For sure. Um, all right. Uh Masters thoughts. Anybody have any thoughts on Scotty Scheffler? You think uh you think Rory is gonna go to live? What's what's the what's the latest <laughs> in the golf world? Scotty Scheffler makes it too easy. You know, I watch someone who you say it's effortless, but I mean, he just knocks it down the middle of the fairway. He hits shots on the greens. He makes putts. He makes it look so simple. He's such a humble guy, too. Makes him really likable. Mm -hmm. um, but just watch him execute. It seemed like everybody would have those up and downs. He doesn't have those ups and downs. When he gets out there on Sunday, I mean, he just he took over. He had one basically, I think, one yep. bad hole. Uh, yep. But like I said, he just makes it look so effortless the way he hits the ball and just like there's no stress on him whatsoever. Man, the only thing just, I'll say to that coach, I did this like this because he's just kind of even keeled, right? He mm -hmm. just, but I will say this: I watched that very closely on on Sunday. If Max Homa and uh, Murakawa just one or two putts, and they put mm -hmm. they start putting pressure on Scheffler, and nobody yeah. could do that, it seemed like, and there were putts that were rimming out, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, all it takes is one guy to make a couple of putts there. And it put mm -hmm. some pressure on him. He didn't have that, mm -hmm. right? Have and I wanted to mm -hmm. see. I wanted to see how he react to that. This was not Tiger dominating back whenever, right? He just, just yeah. destroyed the field. Scheffler did right. not destroy the field. Yes, he was very consistent. But I want to see him react when somebody's putting some pressure on him, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not. Yeah. Don't don't take this the wrong way. Scheffler is unbelievable. He's he's yeah. incredible. But mm -hmm. I want to see somebody right there on his heels and see how he reacts to that.
Yeah, and I think there's I think there's two there's two points to that that you're making, Eddie. One, yeah, I would love to see. To me, I don't know how good Scotty Scheffler is. I think that he, uh, to JT again in the chat said that he might end up with a closet full of green jackets. I think he might. Um, I think he has the the potential. Well, didn't we say that win. about Jordan Spieth? We said the same thing a few <laughs> years true. ago, right? That that's true. That's true. Yeah. Here's here's what I think though is like I think that the difference. There's two parts to this. One, I think yes you know we don't know we didn't see him under pressure at augusta on sunday uh really under pressure right and having to make shots uh but also there's a reason like why he wasn't under pressure right i think he like oh, sure. the other guys feeling the pressure of that of that sure. second nine uh, on sunday and him not yeah. i think is the is the other side of that coin and so i you know i, I you know for me I, for my money i think i think he's uh he's as he's as good as they come i think it is I will say I do think people need to slow their roll a little bit. I mean, yes. he's won two Masters. Great. Um, and there's only 18. He's one of 15 guys that's won two Masters. 18 mm -hmm. guys total, so that's impressive. Correct, yeah. which is incredible. Uh, yeah. But he, you know, but he he he's uh, he, he's had a lot of good finishes in the in the other majors, but uh, hasn't won hasn't any won of them yet. Uh, right. Hasn't won like he's only he only has I think this is what his ninth or tenth win on the PGA Tour. So. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what he's really made of. But really, I was really impressed with him and um, and this whole live stuff. I don't know what's going on with you know Roy. Roy McElroy has denied that he's going to live. Um, do we think it's like a Nick Saban? Uh, I will. I won't be the Alabama football coach. Um, <laughs> comment. <laughs> and then when they someone, back the truck up. When uh, someone gives you yeah. a check, a link check, and tells mm. you to fill out the number, you'll do anything they want. So it's yeah. a matter I think of how it, much money. Roy McIlroy has been a player of mine that I've enjoyed watching over the years, and he's been the main spokesperson to stay heavily on the advocacy of the PGA Tour side, which I think is definitely a, a very sacred organization. It's something I've watched you know, my entire life. I feel like LIV, LIV has kind of taken sort of that almost like what we're talking about a while ago with Kiffin. You know, it's kind of more of the – it's just trying to appeal to a different matter, and, and unfortunately yes. the only thing that's driving that matter is money. If, if McElroy goes, he will be the biggest contradiction that ever happened. And honestly, mm -hmm. to me, they're going to end up destroying the PGA Tour if that happens over yep. time. I don't, it won't be immediate. It'll be it'll probably a little bit later. But I think the PGA Tour will dissolve if we continue to see these people who have stood firm of staying in the PGA Tour and then decide, you know what, the money's just too good. I'm going to go to the LIV. And they're going to realize yeah. it's the same thing, temporary versus the longevity of things. Yeah, yeah it's not really just about – the the money though i will say it's part of it is what the pga tour did to themselves last year when they you know you had these guys who were standing firm and then all of a sudden the pga goes out and you know does this backroom deal yeah. like fake merger with live without consulting these guys and so now they're in the situation where it's like well wait a second like y'all y'all went and had you know i i stuck my neck out here y'all went and had these negotiations without me um and now it's like can i you know can I trust, uh, can I trust these guys over here that, um, uh, that we're actually going to do the right thing or am I going to, you know, continue to stick my neck out, turn down this money and then end up in some weird merger anyway, when I could have, you know, been on the other uh, side of it and come back this yeah. way, you know, it's like, I, I think some of them are thinking like, yeah, I can go over here. They'll pay me all this money. And then these, the, they're, they're going to merge anyway. And, um, I don't know, but what I will say, uh, what I will say about live just in general, um, I feel like it's it's kind of I told some friends this today. I feel like Live is like if in the in the early 2000s in 2001 when the XFL launched and you had Rod Smart like he hate me and Michael Furry from South Carolina wide receiver like you had these guys those guys. If the XFL could have afford could have had the money to pay Peyton Manning or Kurt Warner at that time to come play in the XFL Right. It's that kind of to me, it's that kind of thing. It's like, yeah, I would have tuned in and watched like Peyton yeah. Manning playing in this like league over here. But then when I saw that he was throwing to Rod Smart and Michael Furry, I probably would have been like, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to watch that very right. much anymore. Right. And that's what I feel like with Liv. It's like there's this there, there there's only so much that you can do by buying personalities when the product itself is not good it's like you go and watch and you're yeah. like okay well yep i just watched you know um john rom tee off and then i'm gonna watch nine guys who have no idea who they Never are they're not yeah. they're not very good um you know and 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 also they you know they have these team names and all this weird stuff going on 
and I think that's what you know to me uh, is um, yeah that's that's why I hope Rory McIlroy stays out of that is mostly for the tradition yes but I also think it's just like dude just for you know at some point you know you got to force uh, force the issue with make it a better product if you're going to pay for these guys to go over um yeah. uh but um but yeah we'll see all right well, last I, thing and then we I get, I, i'll give a quick yeah. quick input because i'm not a huge exactly. golf guy i'm a ma- yeah. i'm a major snob that's all i care about <laughs> is the majors okay and okay. live has completely lost me i mean i yeah. i don't know what's going on there it's on. I don't watch it. I don't care yep. because I, I'm yep. one of these fans that watches the Masters, the British Open, the PGA, and, mm-hmm. and that's it. That's all the I US care Open. about. Huh? What? U.S. Open. And yeah, the U.S. Yeah. Open, right. I, that's yeah. all I care about. So yep. when Liv's on, I'm like, I have no interest in that. I just don't care. And I'm sorry Correct. if that makes me a bad fan, but that's the way I am with golf. Yeah. yeah. Me I mean, it's, exactly it's, how I am. Yeah. Again, it's the difference between, you know, it's like – Again, going back to the XFL analogy, if Peyton Manning had they had bought, bought Peyton Manning to come play in the XFL and he had made it to the championship game, I would I may have watched it, but I wouldn't even know. You know, it's like, <laughs> like do they seem to have the same rules? Like, what is this championship yeah. game? You know, yeah. it's it's uh it's the difference between tuning into a Super Bowl and tuning right. into you know, some other some other league. All right, Eddie, before we get out of here, we're going to wrap it up now. Before we get out of here, tell us about these uh, red beans and rice I've been hearing about. <laughs> so, yeah, Andy and I do a cooking show on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. we do. Yeah. 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 So just I a heard, back right here. I cooked yeah. a meal Sunday. It took me forever. I had to cook it from scratch, and I thought I'd come on the podcast with Andy and Paul and say, y'all guess what I made because it, it slaved over it for my boy. He loves it. It's his favorite meal, my favorite meal. I'm from New Orleans, and it's my favorite meal. It's red beans and rice, and it was fantastic. And by the way, no one guessed it. No, no one guessed not it. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. And then when I finally revealed it, I got absolutely destroyed because everybody's like, well, you can go to Popeye's and get red beans and rice. I'm like, no, that's not the same thing. If you've ever made it from scratch, you have to make a roux. With The roux itself takes 40 minutes, okay? You're nodding Ooh. your head, John. That looks like you know what yep. I'm talking about. I made about. it. Yep. It's a yep. very, very technical dish, and it's very good. And to, yep. your, to your point, John, it's excellent, and it's even better the day after because it sits in the fridge, Absolutely. and it gets, it gets all the seasonings. We just had it tonight. Fantastic. Thank you for asking. And screw you're you, welcome, Andy. Man. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. I'm going what to eat a ribeye steak as soon as we get off of here. So yeah, my ribeye steak is yeah. way better than that, Chris. Well, listen, I will tell you. So my mom is from Lake Charles, Louisiana. Okay, there and you so go. If people, yeah. yeah, so if people think that this red beans and rice is what you're getting – at Popeyes, Mm-mm. please, y'all, y'all, you have no idea. It's kind of like know the tradition but, behind red beans and rice, John, because this is how I grew up. So every yeah. Monday, my mother would make red beans and rice. You know where that came from? Back in the old days, the people that would take care of your house, the maids, yep. I'll go ahead and say it, yeah. they would cook red beans and rice on Mondays. It was wash day. And that's mm-hmm. something you can, after you make everything, it takes forever. You sit it on the on the pot and you let it sit for three hours. And that was Monday meals. And every night growing up on Mondays, I had that red beans and rice. And it's my favorite dish. My grandmother made it better than anybody in the world. So there you go. I love it. I love that's it. That's cool. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah. Fantastic. See, there you go. That's why you, that's why you listen to the end of the show because you get that's all right. the good stuff. At the very the whole, that's right. The whole show. Uh, yeah, well, thanks y'all for tuning in. If you're if you're listening to this, uh, please uh, subscribe to the to our YouTube channel. Uh, follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And follow I'll say this: at- follow yeah. John Tweet Sports on Twitter. <laughs> he's a phenomenal follow. He's serious I, and he's a smart ass. That's why I love it. I, <laughs> fantastic. I, listen, it, so I'm I I'm a well rounded person. That's right. Sometimes That's what I love. Yeah. Sometimes you gotta figure uh, it out, right? Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes you uh, get the smile. Sometimes you get the horns. Just you know, it depends <laughs> on how you come in. We can do this one or two ways, but uh, it's gonna be my way. So yeah, follow me at John Tweet Sports. Um, Eddie and Andy, uh, tell the tell the folks where you can find uh, where you can find your stuff again as well. Go ahead, Andy. You can you can find me on Twitter at, at Andy Stoke, and you can go to youtube.com forward slash at UGA Sports for our Sunday night call in show with Paul Meharry. And you can find us at youtube.com forward slash at A and E Podcasting 
and on YouTube for our Thursday night show. Awesome. And then please go follow at Coach Hayes Huddle yes. at Coach sure. Hayes H U D L. Uh, subscribe to his YouTube channel as well, Coach. You keep inching toward that thousand subscriber mark. I'm and, trying to uh, get to one K, no doubt. Maybe we're we're going to have a party. Some hot dogs. That'll boost it up. We're going to have know, a party. Right? Yeah, we're going to we're going to see how many hot dogs he can eat live. Yeah. That's going to be his reward for getting a thousand subscribers. But no, go go follow Coach. You can find all of this stuff. We'll put it all in the description of the of the podcast and the and the show. Um, and we will see y'all next time. Thanks, guys.